We have two people standing by right now as our panelists, and the first one up is Dr. Peter Duisberg. Dr. Duisberg is Professor of Molecular and Cellular Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a world-renowned expert in retroviruses. He was the first to identify an oncogene in 1970. Even Dr. Gallo has stated in a quote from 1992, quote, Peter Duisberg knows more about retroviruses than any man alive, unquote. And yet throughout his career, he has been among the world's scientists who claim uh, that HIV is not the cause of AIDS. Nice to have you with us today, Dr. Duisberg. Hello, hello, Gary. Now, mm. uh, re- just a little while ago, we had uh, Dr. Luc Montagnier and Dr. Gallo on the show, and Dr. Montagnier contradicted his claims that he has made earlier. They're claiming now that they have all the DNA. It's only HIV is enough to cause AIDS. Dr. Gallo said if you don't get people into treatment programs, you're risking their life. It's irresponsible. Anyone who challenges this principle and challenges National Institutes of Health's position in National Academy of Science is uh, is a denier and irresponsible. And, of course, that would mean that you are one of those being attacked and all the other thousands of scientists being attacked. I ask him to, to please not use this form to personally attack people as he was not being attacked. Tell Siggy how to get on. So could you give us your position now, uh, after you've been in this mm-hmm. battle for so many years, first tell us what you think about HIV. Do you still believe that it is harmless? Do you believe it's even been proven now with the new evidence uh, of Gallo's changing his original uh, work that Popovac did and scribbling out and changing it completely? Do you believe that it's been founded? And what do you believe about AIDS, Gallo, and this whole war on AIDS? Look, I, let's start with the basics. Science is based on standards. Um, so some of those all of us know and understand, even those who have never studied science. And the first prediction of the virus AIDS hypothesis, which Gallo defends and actually Montagnier confirms, unconfirms and confirms, depending on the environment or the situation, uh, that would predict that AIDS is contagious. Viruses make a living from going one host to the next host. That's what General Coop predicted, Surgeon General predicted in 1984-5, that it would be an endemic in America and Europe, decimating people, attacking the heterosexuals. They would be decimated, just like the homosexuals that were already being decimated. It would be transmitted sexually and would spread like wildfire, in Europe and America. Now, we all know what contagiousness means, even the, the primary school kids, our, our own included. They actually uh, appreciate when they have a flu or measles, in part because they don't have to go to school, or if somebody else in the school has it, uh, they wouldn't have to attend because it would be transmitted from person to person. Now, let's look at that prediction with AIDS. Now, 25 years after Gallo and Heckler announced at an international press conference in Washington in April 23, 1984, that AIDS was caused by a virus, we had in America, according to the latest CDC statistic, 1,030,832 AIDS patients. The headquarters of AIDS research in our country, on which we spent about 5 or $10 billion a year, 25 years after the discovery of HIV. So we have no disease for HIV. We cannot explain what it does. It is not contagious. What we have, and Gallo is very proud of, and Montagnier too, they can detect antibodies against the virus that is associated by definition with AIDS, namely antibody against this virus. But they never can explain why doesn't this antibody protect the patient against the disease. And that is what actually, again, all of us know, even when they haven't studied science. Every doctor, every teacher will tell you in school, now you get a vaccination, so you won't get the flu, or you won't get the measles, or you won't get the mumps. Once you have it, you protect it. The only exception in the literature, or science, or in whatever it is, immunology, virology, is HIV. When you have antibodies, then they just say the opposite. Oh, you have antibodies against HIV? We can't find the virus because the antibody is neutralizing it. But now you are in trouble. Five or ten years later, you get AIDS. Well, um, why would we get AIDS from an antibody? 
Nobody ever explained it, including the National Institute of Allergy Infectious Diseases, as Clifford Lane just wrote in the Journal of American Medical Association a year ago. And then, back to our original question, why is it then that AIDS, if it's an infectious disease, spread sexually, is not showing up 25 years after a million were said to be positive in America and a million, half a million in Europe, 25 years later in the heterosexual population. I mean, sexually, uh, having sex, uh, unprotected sex, we have four and a half to five million babies in this country and the same is happening in Europe and they don't get it. That's my comment. <laughs> okay, well, it's very good comments. Now, I'm going to ask you two last questions. First, sure. when I visited you at your campus, uh, there were two gentlemen, two professors, senior professors on your floor, uh, Dr. Stroman and also Dr. Bailey, who said, we know that Peter is right, meaning Peter Duisburg is right, that it's the recreational drugs, it's the lifestyle that's causing the people who were diagnosed with AIDS, mainly at that time, intravenous drug users in the heterosexual community and fast-track gays in the gay community and hemophiliacs. And you said very clearly to me, you took a book off a shelf, and it was a humongous book, and you said, here is a book on retroviruses. This is everything we know about retroviruses. And there's not one retrovirus in this book that will do what this, uh, what we're claiming AIDS is about. And he said, why aren't they looking then, you said it rhetorically, why aren't they looking at the lifestyle? They're trying to make us believe that every American whether you're a farmer in, in Nebraska or a 16-year-old uh, virgin, that everybody's equally re uh, capable of getting AIDS. And you said, that is nonsense. That's not going to happen. I walked down the hall, and I interviewed two of the other scientists there, and they said, Peter's right. They're absolutely... Professor Rubin probably was one of them. He the was. Other. Rubin yes. was one of them. And, and he, Stroman the other. <laughs> yes, and they both said, but Peter is... Peter has the unfortunate position of being one, and this is what Stroman said, and I've never told you this. Peter, Str uh, Peter said, uh, Str Dr. Stroman, Professor Stroman said about you, there is no question that we all know that Peter Duisburg was the brightest professor in this field, and that's why they're attacking him. They know that if they can take down the best and the brightest, the people with far less intellect and far less courage will not stand up then. And so, that will end the people wanting to stick their heads above the above the bushes to, to challenge them. And I remember him saying this, thinking, wow. And I said, what's been your response? He says, well, wherever I can, I tell the truth. But Peter's the one that has the charisma, the personality, the reputation. And then he went through this whole thing about your reputation. I didn't know how you had won all these National Institutes of Health um, uh, awards for research. You were a researcher of of the year and something. That's when I was the blue-eyed boy. This is all over now. I get no cans for nothing anymore. Yeah, <laughs> but, I was. But, but my first question then is, what is it like to have been one of the top scientists in American history with outstanding reputation, all that could come, and then you challenge a medical, um, a, a medical fraud, and you're the one who is chastised for it, and everyone else who stuck their head up to say something they lost their research grants. What does this say about democracy and science, democracy and American medicine? I think you pointed it out yourself earlier. It is long gone, this so-called democracy, in science. It's as centralized as you can get. It's institutionalized as you can get. It is all decided at the NIH or the Institute of Medicine by study sections and so-called study sections as pseudo-democracy. You elect the most established professors in the field to decide what's the truth. It's almost exactly the same as the cardinals deciding on the truth in the Catholic Church. There is no, there is no jury like the American jury system that is people without a conflict of interest. The people who decide are the most established people who have worked 20 or 30 years in the field, have made their career, their names, their fortunes and their whole life investments, exactly like Gallo and Montagnier on this virus. How could they possibly questioning it now? We would need a, a, a jury without a conflict of interest. And we have that, actually, fortunately, in the American Constitution in the legal system. 